Welcome everyone. We're so glad to be here with you all um, after a long time. We're so excited. Uh, this is actually our natural um, state of uh, communicating with our uh, you know, audience, which is this conversation that you and I uh, have with them because this is how the two of us met, regular uh, conversations about science and hoping to actually translate science into a way where it's palatable. It's actually, so we are glad to be back. Absolutely, really excited about it. So today we decided to talk about um, one of the items that has been highlighted in the news, which is Bruce Willis's diagnosis uh, with aphasia. And we were saddened by it. I mean, he's been a very prominent figure in, Amazing. in the movies and in our lives. I mean, we can just name movies, remember his character and how it influenced the community and the society. And so he was diagnosed with aphasia. Initially, it was very vague um, because aphasia in itself is a very a broad term. Yeah, it's not a, you couldn't even call it a d disease. It's a symptom. It's, it's a, a symptom. A, it's a, it means basically a disorder of language. Exactly. And there are so many different ways that you can approach this disease or, or get the aphasia symptomology. It could be from a vascular, um, 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 you know, a vascular phenomenon such as stroke. It could happen as a result of a degenerative process, which we'll talk about, such as frontotemporal lobe dementia as a variant of it. Or it could be as a result of trauma to the head or, you know, some inflammatory process. So a lot of ways that people could get aphasia. So when they said aphasia, it really wasn't, that content filled. It, we didn't have that much information. But it's becoming a little more clear from the stories. I mean, in People Magazine and others, uh, we've, we've seen uh, families speak about the progressive nature of it. It wasn't a sudden thing. And they said they're, they don't remember any head traumas in his life that could have caused this. So that's where uh, we're kind of guessing that it was probably a degenerative process that started. Right. So let's go ahead and start by defining the um, the condition or the, the symptom. Yeah. So aphasia essentially is a condition that affects um, the way we communicate. Um, it can affect the speech. It can affect the way we write, the way we understand language as it is. Um, and like you mentioned earlier, it can happen all of a sudden when people tend to have a stroke. So whether it's an ischemic stroke, which means there's a clot that blocks the flow of blood to a part of the brain or a hemorrhagic stroke which means when an artery bursts open and there's bleeding in the in the substance of the brain and depending on the specific area of the brain that is involved it could be different types of aphasia so it could be receptive aphasia or expressive aphasia receptive aphasia is the type of aphasia that is that affects our understanding of language so exactly. you know people don't really follow commands it affects their language to a uh, to, in many aspects it could be very subtle where they have um, difficulty saying certain words or naming certain items or it could be what we called word salad, which means you put different kind of words together and you just have this incoherent speech. Expressive aphasia is the type where you have difficulty producing words altogether. So you do understand what people are, are telling you, you do understand what's going on, but you have difficulty expressing it. And that is one of the most frustrating stroke syndromes or aphasias that we usually see. Mm -hmm. And you see this quite often with yeah, um, you being a stroke specialist. It's a fairly common type of stroke because it's actually involves for most people. And, and this is kind of interesting because the handedness matters if you're right-handed or left-handed. For most people who are right-handed and about 90% or 95% of people, language centers are on the left hemisphere mm -hmm. and left frontal um, uh, parietal area. And the area that is expressing, it's called Broca's area. Broca's and Wernicke's are two uh, German uh, 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 scientists that actually de describe these areas. The Broca's area is the area that actually is responsible for production of language. We know that's a little more complicated than that. It's not just one area that's responsible. There are systems that, that involve multiple sections of the brain, but that's where usually the production damage happens in the front of, the, um, uh, of this uh, region. And then Wernicke is a little further back in the temporal where understanding of language mm -hmm. happens. But for those who are left-handed, for majority of them, of them, still it's on the left hemisphere language. That's why whenever we, uh, we get a history from patients, we always ask, are you right-handed right or left-handed? But for a uh, percentage of them, actually language is on the other side. Right, I think it's, um, 
you know, less than 5% of left-handed people have their language so centers very on small. the right side. Exactly. Very, very small. Percentage. Now, here's the uh, interesting thing. Uh, for those who have damage to the right hemisphere and they're still left-handed, their type of aphasia doesn't affect so much language and it affects uh, emotional understanding and recognizing faces and emotions, which is very interesting. Yes. So in any case, for stroke, it happens suddenly. For a lot of traumas, it happens over time. For degenerative diseases, such as frontotemporal lobe dementia, it happens in a, over a long period of time. It starts very subtly. Um, frontotemporal lobe dementia is a type of dementia that involves, as the name implies, frontal lobe and temporal lobe. It has subtypes. It has the behavioral and executive type, which means it affects behavior, which, where the first signs are usually um, uh, behavioral, where they're doing things or saying things that they wouldn't have done before. Right. Or executive, where they're forgetting how to do things that they could do before. For example, um, you know, programming a, a television. Uh, well, actually, that's difficult for most that's of us. That's kind of difficult. Yeah, but let's yeah. say, um, you know, um, uh, figuring out the microwave. Right. Or, or, or sometimes, or, you know, functioning with things that they've functioned with before, like um, using a remote control. Uh, making phone calls uh, or finding names and addresses on, on their phones, exactly. especially if it's a more complicated phone. Now, the other type of uh, frontotemporal lobe dementia, where, which actually applies to this situation, and we think that this is what um, uh, Mr. Bruce Willis has, is a primary progressive aphasia. Again, primary progressive aphasia is a, the aphasia of language. It happens over time. Uh, and there are two types. There is the semantic type, and then there is the you know the motor type where a person has difficulty producing language. And the semantic type is the type where they have difficulty understanding language. There's more complexity to it than that, but it, it actually kind of fits the same kind of distributions that it has to its human anatomy as strokes. Now, the interesting thing is whenever somebody has the beginnings of dementia and is early onset, like before the age of 65, Yes, it could be Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's, but the ratio uh, becomes very much more on the side of frontotemporal lobe dementia. Now, we've spoken about this before, Alzheimer's is the dominant form of dementia, but 60% or 70% of all dementias is Alzheimer's. But frontotemporal lobe dementia accounts for 10 to 20% of dementias. Um, and, but if it happens early in life, if a dementia is starting early in life, the ratio is 50-50. It's not 10 to 90. It's 50-50. So if a person is starting to have language problems or behavioral issues before the age of 65, one has to say that it's most likely uh, frontotemporal dementia as much as it is Alzheimer's. So that has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. The other thing about frontotemporal lobe dementia is that they're very much they're m driven more by genetic factors than Alzheimer's is. And you, have not, uh, you and I have spoken about this, that Alzheimer's, all diseases have genetic contribution, but the type that uh, has much higher penetrance, genetic penetrance, meaning that the genes have a much greater influence on outcome, for Alzheimer's, it's 3% is 100% genetic you know, penetrance, 3% of Alzheimer's. For frontotemporal lobe dementia, that number is much higher. People are saying as much as 40% or so, meaning that if you have frontotemporal lobe dementia, it's not much you can do to avert it. So there is a bigger genetic component, and that speaks to the fact that it starts earlier as well. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's not as much driven by vascular factors that would happen later or inflammatory factors that would happen later. So this picture is what we're gathering from Bruce Willis' um, history, where he started having some difficulty with understanding, had some difficulty with production of language. In fact, they, there's in, in the article, some, some people have said that that he actually had to wear earpieces in some of his latest movies where lines had to be given to him. So he was That's having uh, forgetfulness. Not so much forgetfulness, words. He was having difficulty with words. Ah. So that's the, the component that we're seeing in, in him. That's, that's very sad. It's incredibly frustrating. It really is. Um, so let's talk about how it's diagnosed. Um, you know, sometimes um, the symptoms um, actually 
um, they continue to evolve and they stay. Uh, they're very prominent in people for a very long time and they come into the clinic um, seeking for help. Uh, but uh, other times, even with very subtle changes, some you know proactive individuals want to go and take care of it. So when they come to a neurologist, the first thing is a very thorough history. Like you just described, you know, the onset of symptoms, how it evolved, any associating uh, symptoms, signs, um, any changes in their circumstances circumstances, all of this actually helps with the diagnosis as well. And then the second most important thing is imaging, correct? Correct. So they get either a CT scan of the brain or an MRI of the brain. What happens is definitely MRI, which is, uh, but also in this case, insurance um, often allows for PET scan. Whereas in other kind of dementias, it's it's actually not a, a approved um, a imaging technique, but for frontotemporal of dementia, it is because it, it really is a good distinguishing uh, tool. Uh, PET scan, and in this case, the FDG PET, which is looks at uh, radioactive glucose. And when I say radioactive, we're talking about the minuscule, minuscule yes. amounts uh, of uh, where they, they inject the glucose. And then we look at how the brain is using it. And the pattern that arises with frontal temporal lobe dementia is that distinctly, the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe is not using the glucose uh, appropriately uh, or efficiently. And, and that stands out. Um, so one of the things that people might ask if they're having problems with language or behavior, or if they have a family member that has a problem with language or behavior, and there's a suspicion of frontotemporal lobe dementia or prefrontal lobe dementia, then they should actually um, ask their uh, neurologist to get a PET scan as well, because it's quite helpful. Agreed. The pathology is also a little different. Pathology of Alzheimer's is driven by uh, amyloid and tau and uh, for, for frontal temporal lobe, it's different kind of uh, proteins that, you know, synuclein and, um, and, and others. And here's the interesting thing, about 5% of uh, frontal temporal lobe dementias also develop uh, movement disorders, 5 to 10%, mm. such as ALS, mm. which is Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, so it kind of tells you that, 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 that relationship as well. Yeah. So um, usually when they do an MRI, it's to look at the volume of the brain because sometimes you get to have, um, you get to see some shrinkage or atrophy of specific parts of the brain. And it's that discrepancy between the atrophy in one part of the brain compared to all of the brain that tells you, that indicates that yes, there is a problem. So MRI is usually used for that. And also sometimes MRI is used to rule out other things, right? For example, if somebody comes in with aphasia, you want to make sure that they haven't had a stroke. So a stroke is usually ruled out with an MRI as Correct. well. Correct. Um, but like you said, PET scan specifically can actually give us a whole lot of information if it is a neurodegenerative condition. Correct. Correct. The important thing to know is that although we said that it's less amenable to lifestyle, but it is still to some extent amenable to lifestyle. And, and especially if one starts early, early on. Lifestyle just means at the best to give the brain the best food and nutrition and, uh, and, and uh, vitamins and everything else that it needs and take away all the things that cause harm and trauma and inflammation and oxidation and all these things that, that, that might propagate the underlying genetic risk. So yes, in any condition, even in one that has genetic uh, predominance or, uh, or penetrance, 100% uh, penetrance, still will respond to environmental and lifestyle factors. So, so don't discount that completely. Right, which brings us to the um, topic of treatment. How is aphasia treated? Um, you brought up um, you know, lifestyle, and um, I agree with you, but there is no mainstay treatment for aphasia. We don't have any medication. Um, you know, we, we don't have any agent that reverses this condition at all. It's a neurodegenerative condition. Um, are there any medications that can actually slow down the progression of this disease? There really isn't. What can help is um, a, a speech therapy, ironically, especially in this kind of aphasia type, subtypes. Uh, speech therapy definitely helps quite a bit. It, uh, it, it gives us the tool to maintain language as long as possible to, for, uh, for, for many of the patients. And do you think that that is because of the neuroplasticity aspect of uh, cognition, you know, with speech therapy and with practicing saying words and hearing words and working on one's vocabulary, the part of the brain that is responsible for language, does it change? Uh, it does. I mean, there is plasticity. Now, we have to realize that uh, while we're building that plasticity, it's undergoing significant trauma. It's, it's uh, Because there's an underlying degenerative process that's happening. 
And of course, we might be able to slow it down with giving it the right nutrients and the right environment and all of that. And giving the connectivity some chance by giving, you know, challenging the brain with words and, and uh, lingu uh, speech therapy. But the degenerative process is continuing. We have no tools, no medication at this point. But we're very optimistic. I mean, um, to Bruce Willis's family and everybody else, we live in an age of AI and research moving at an exponential rate. And we think that in the next five to 10 years, we will have not only a greater understanding of this disease and similar diseases, but also better cures, new paths to cure. I'm very sad to hear about the struggles he's going through. And, and we see this on a, on a daily basis in our clinics with the patients who come in with frontotemporal lobe dementia. The frustration is immense, especially with aphasia, especially the type that actually understands but can't produce, which, uh, you know, um, the, uh, and that is one of the most frustrating things I've ever seen in my life when patients have a stroke and they can, they can understand, but they can't speak. And some of the family members actually don't understand that disparity and they treat them as though they have dementia or some friends. Um, so I want everybody in the audience to recognize that if you have a friend or family member who has aphasia, dementia, uh, or cognitive decline as a result of stroke, don't just assume because they can't produce language or have diminished language production that they don't have as much uh, uh, understanding or nearly as much understanding as before. Be on the side of uh, assuming that they understand much of what you're uh, speaking to. So um, uh, uh, that's, that's the one thing, one lesson I learned very early on when a patient that came to me and we're not going to name them. Uh, was a um, uh, and 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 he um, was a coach. Let's just say that. So very popular person who had many friends and many uh, conversations. He was he was a talker, as the family would say, and now had aphasia and couldn't produce. And and but yet he, his understanding was there. In fact, it was so ironic that during the clinic visit, I actually dis deduced that. His understanding was way better than his, his production. The wife knew as well, but the rest of the family couldn't figure this out. And this, this incredibly powerful man who was a coach of a football team, all of a sudden starts crying and, and can't tell me why he's crying, but, and he couldn't even write why he was crying because he had lost that capacity as well. But we, when I said, you know, it, is it because you can, understand and you want to know say what you want to say but you just can't produce it and he said yes and you are you getting frustrated that some people don't understand don't see this in your family he, he said yes and just started crying like you could never imagine somebody like that crying and the wife said he has never cried like this before wow. imagine that level of frustration now i don't want to make this dramatic and sad uh, 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 because it it can be and it is but at the same time we want to make sure that everybody understand that the reason we, we have these podcasts is to bring a certain level of empathy, but not empty empathy, uh, meaning that uh, engaging the population, engaging the, the, the general population and, and understanding that they have a hand in the cure. Research requires funding, research requires uh, populations to push for funding in, uh, in a one direction or the other. And when it comes to dementias, um, there's more funding needed. Um, there is um, a wider range of type of research needed. And we, you and I, we do uh, lifestyle and prevention, not just lifestyle, but prevention research. And more needs to be, um, um, you know, invested in that, in that realm as well. And um, yeah, I, I, I just feel their frustration, the family's frustration. We give them our love. And uh, we hope that, um, uh, that soon enough there is a cure or at least an, a drug or, or tool that can abate the, pro the progression. Absolutely. And there are a great number of wonderful universities around the world who are doing uh, incredible research and for people to be connected to that. But um, the core therapy is obviously not to lose hope and um, continuing the speech therapy at this point. Correct. All right. Beautifully stated, Dean. Thank you. Thank you.